Hey, this is episode 666. Dum, dum, dum. But if you're wondering where all of the other episodes are um, that you've missed over the last week or so, those episodes are available to you at patreon.com forward slash the BPD show because this is a capitalistic system and I've got bills to pay. So there are a lot of episodes that only patrons have gotten access to. So go to patreon.com forward slash the BPD show. Let's get on with the show. The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.thebenjamindixonshow.com to register for our blog and join the progressive army. So today has been one of those days. I literally just got through recording or talking for about 15 minutes about the topics that I wanted to talk about. And my recorder wasn't on. But... <laughs> I didn't realize it until my first cue music came came across from telling me that my time was coming up. I was supposed to be wrapping up and I looked and I'm like, well, hell, there's nothing being recorded. Welcome to today's podcast. I w- had every intention of releasing a new video today, um, but that video was going to have to wait as I kind of grapple with a really big topic of um, black Christianity being used to make um, and keep black people docile in response to white supremacy. It's a huge topic. And um, I recorded and I edited it and I looked at it and I'm like, no, it's not ready yet. Um, so that was that was on my agenda for today. I did most of today doing that. And then I was like, OK, well, I got to put something out for the patrons. And then I record something for I mean, I rec- yeah, really for the patrons. I love all of you. <laughs> but the, the fact of the matter is, I really was like, I got to do this for the patrons. Um, but then I start recording and I look at the device and I'm like, well, hell, I can't get anything right today. But that's totally fine. I'm 100 percent capable of recreating that magic um, that was the last recording that didn't record. What I talked about is what I'm going to talk about now. Stacey Abrams here in Georgia. I mean, things are have been set ablaze in this state because Stacey Abrams, the first uh, if she if elected, uh, she would be the first African-American woman governor in the entire nation. 2018. And we're still accomplishing firsts like that. Things that should be mundane, things that should be uneventful. We're still accomplishing those first. Um, and that lets you know how much progress we have not made in this country. But here in the state of Florida, Stacey Abrams is being attacked for burning a, a, a burning a flag. That's how it's being per- said, literally for the sake of, of clicks. The Washington Post, the New York Times, uh, of course, conservatives are going to run with that. She burned a flag back in 1992 while she was in college. And um, now everyone is losing their minds. Never mind the fact that the flag that she burned was the 1956 Georgia flag, which had enshrined in it the symbol of white supremacy and the Confederacy, the stars and bars, was the most prominent feature of that flag. Never mind that that flag was intentionally created to enshrine white supremacy in the, in this state. That's the flag that she burned. And I know you, my audience, would not care if she burned the American flag. I wouldn't care if she burned the American flag because that is a a constitutional expression of our disgust at what America has done at in particular cases. But in general, we have reasons to protest the United States and what it has become, because what it is is not what it has become, but what it has always been. I wanted to correct myself there on the fly. So even if she had burned an American flag, I don't care. That's all the more reason for me to support her because she is not locked into this idea of American exceptionalism where anything that is done in the name of America is whitewashed in the blood of patriotism, not the blood of patriots, but the blood of patriotism. I would prefer my politicians not be um, not be so not genuflect before the altar of patriotism that they, they cannot protest the United States of America in the most um, fantastic fashion of burning a flag. But she didn't burn the U.S. flag. She didn't even burn the Georgia flag. She burned the 1956 Georgia flag that has the Confederate uh, bars and stars on it, more prominent than any other symbol on that flag. That's what she burned. But of course, the media outlets uh, left that out because it's good for clicks and the conservatives are going to run with it regardless because they need to paint her as this radical who is too scary for the white people of Georgia. 
my good, uh, well, a friend, you know, when, when he's in town, we'll, we'll hang out. Um, but he's a friend, um, Marcus Farrell. He worked for Stacey Abrams, full disclosure, uh, last year, um, during the primaries, he's no longer with the campaign, but he said something on Facebook that absolutely puts it in context. If someone is going to be upset about her burning the Confederate flag, they were never going to vote for her in the first place. And that, my friends, is as good a place as any to gently ease into the argument that I've been having on Twitter nonstop for the last couple of weeks. Um, I'm not going to argue about the specific person I've been arguing with. I'm not going to do that to Brianna, um, um, Brianna Joy. Um, who from the intercept, she and I have disagreed about her positions on um, what I believe is the deprioritization of race. We've disagreed about that for a very long time, um, at least a year, more than a year. Uh, and most of our disagreements have been in um, in our DMs or phone call. So, you know, the fact that we're just now publicly I'm just publicly um, stating my disagreements with her. Um, it's just. That's just my process. I disagree with you for a very long time before I ever say something uh, in public about it. So but I'm not going to discuss her because I know eventually she and I will probably uh, have another phone call or jump on a podcast and argue with each other about it vehemently. And I, it, it, and if I could just say something tangentially here, um, I don't. There are a lot of child. There's a lot of childishness on Twitter. Now, I'm petty and I am an a-hole. My wife knows it. Um, everybody knows it that I am, but I don't look at people disagreeing and disagreeing uh, vociferously and just very intensely. I don't look at that as something that should be avoided. That's literally, literally <laughs> how you make progress. There's really no way to make progress unless you look at your disagreements and you have it out. I used to, I mean, I, when I was younger, I used to think the thing to do would to be, was to not argue. But arguing is literally like a step forward. You, you, you can't get any clarification without arguing. And mind you, some of our arguments do devolve into scorched earth fights. But you will notice the people I get in scorched earth fights are people I generally just kind of feel the way Marcus Farrell said about the people who don't agree with us burning the flag. There are going to be people that not only do you not agree with, but there's really no use utilizing your time trying to convince them. I just know that those people don't only exist in conservative circles. I've known for a long time, if you go back and listen to my stuff, I was warning you guys two years ago that there's some people in progressive circles that are not worth our time argue or to, to give you the luxury of an argument. That, that, that's, see, I respect Joy, and that's why I'll argue with her. That's why I will disagree with her. That's why I won't block her. Somebody asks me, like, don't block her. I'm not going to block her. I'm going to disagree with her. And I'm going to continue to disagree with her. And she's going to disagree with me. It's what adults do. <laughs> and as tangential as I said that that was, this is quite literally very relevant to this idea that we should entertain and try to court or coddle people who have a problem with our stance against white supremacy and racism. I don't care if you're a conservative who has a problem with that or if you're a progressive who thinks that we're playing identity politics and we're creating a problem for the working class because we're, we're you know, we're having we're giving too much race talk. I don't care what side of that you fall on. If you have a problem with that, there's a good chance that you were never going to really be in a coalition with us in the first place, like Marcus said. And I think that's a brilliant thing to just come to grips with. There are people that we should not invest time in. Why? Because there's tens of millions of other people who never voted, who didn't vote, who can be reached with the message of economic populism without the need for racism. <clears throat> Better yet, they not only want your economic populism, but they'll be the very first ones to line up with you to burn a Confederate flag, to tear it down from their monuments. There are literally enough people out there that we should be talking to about class that don't have any problems with race. But yet 
We're obsessed with the voting electorate so much so that we, we have this myopic view that if we don't do what Donald Trump did, if we don't tamper down or temper our approach rather to, to identity politics, if we don't uh, court racist, that somehow we're sabotaging ourselves. When there are literally people out there who are ready for the revolution, um, but you just haven't talked to them. We haven't talked to them. The Democratic Party certainly hasn't talked to them. And if I could just go tangentially one more time, um, I think people misconstrue this, uh, what I've been saying over the last couple of weeks um, and what I've lost many followers over, mainly because I blocked them, not because they unfollowed me. I literally look at people and like, oh, they follow me. Too bad. Block. <laughs> Told y'all I'm a hole. But I think people either intentionally or unintentionally misconstrue what I'm saying to be a defense of the Democratic Party's lack of economic policies that resonate with the people. No, I'm the first one I pro- out of everybody in these conversations that I'm arguing with. I'm the first one with videos on it. Probably one of the first ones with an article on it in this modern era. Of course, you're going to have the old, you know, you're going to have the out Adolf Reeds and, and those people who have been here forever writing these things. But in new media, I'm one of the first people who you enunciated the uh, uh, enumerated rather the problems of the Democratic Party and their proximity to the Republican neoliberalism. Right. And their and their their replication of the conservative uh, neoliberalism. Right. So this has never been about uh, toting the, the, you know, the, the Democratic establishment talking points because, you know, Ben's been bought by George Soros. <laughs> No, this has 100 percent been about even if we give them economic populism the way that we should, regardless. There are going to be people who are never going to join a coalition with us who will gladly sacrifice their economic benefit, who have historically undermined their own economic benefit for the sake of their race and their identity. And so therefore, there is absolutely no reason for us to waste time worrying about them trying to out, outreach voter outreach to racists for what? For what? The cost is too high. The price of that coalition is your silence on race issues because the minute you say something about race, you scare them away and they're gone back to Donald Trump because he's giving them what they want. The problem is, is that there are racists in the Democratic Party. And the moment, and the moment the the the, the the instant that the Democratic Party became the party of quote unquote identity politics, the racists left. So many of them left. I mean, study after study, you could disagree with it as much as you want, but study after study has shown that that is when racists started leaving the party. 2016 was a realignment of the current voting electorate based on racial identity. More so than economic anxiety. Economic anxiety was there, yes, but more so than economic anxiety was their racial identity, the belief that the Democratic Party was no longer the home for white people. Even if they were white working class, a portion of their calculation based on survey after survey, study after study, was their whiteness first and foremost. And so, yes, there were racists in the Democratic Party. That's how Bill Clinton won in 92. I think people, see, people don't, people aren't able, they don't want to. They're intentionally obtuse. They don't, they don't want to hold two ideas at the same time. Yes, Bill Clinton catered to racists in 92, indirectly with dog whistles and directly with his speech before Stone Mountain. Bill Clinton, you know, with his, his tough on crime rhetoric. Bill Clinton was Still, that's because in 92, the Democratic Party probably had Confederate flags waving at some of their conventions. That was 92. 2008, Hillary Clinton played dog whistle politics. Some express language that was racist. Her husband, most certainly. You know why? Because the Democratic Party was still the party. Well, one of two parties that were racist in this country. 2008. Barack Obama played the same game. 
He played the same game by telling black people to pull up their pants and and using identity. I mean, I'm sorry, respectability politics as a means of of telling black people to get their thing together. And and he was the good black guy because he never really talked about race. He never he never really talked about it until he had to. You know, it wasn't until after he was elected that he actually talked about uh, racial discrimination and police violence. And he, that was only after being forced after 30 days of protest across the country and people calling him out for it that he finally said something something about Trayvon Martin in the Rose Garden. But up until that point, he had been, you know, the black people, you got to take care of your children and pull up your pants. And I'm like, Obama, please, man. But that he still did the same thing. Why? Because that type of language resonated with the racist base that existed, that 25 percent of the base that voted for Barack Obama, even though they still believed that interracial dating was wrong. So how did Obama win that? By never being a racial threat to them, but never being a threat to their racist radars. And by talking down to black people in respectability politics, which was like the last line, the last vestige of this, of, uh, of, of, of sanitized racism that could be presented by white people and black people or mixed people like Barack Obama. So 92, Bill Clinton was racist and did play to dog whistle whistle racism because where was this country in 92? Extremely racist. The Democratic Party, just as racist. 2008, Hillary Clinton played the same game. But, ah, a plot twist. Barack Obama did the same thing in his own way. 2016, things changed. Before 2016, after Trayvon Martin, things changed in a very significant fashion. This world, I know firsthand because when I was in college years ago, (laughs) when I was in college the first time in 1998, dropped out, came back around 2004, whatever, whatever time I finished college, I finished college. I, I did good when I finished But the point was, there wasn't anybody really talking about this stuff. You had a few radical writers who kept pressing the issue, uh, scholars. But in terms of the general conversation nationwide, it wasn't happening. Not in the fashion that you saw when Trayvon Martin got killed. When Trayvon Martin got killed, the politics of this nation changed in a fundamental fashion. When Black Lives Matter was formed after Michael Brown was killed, and after the, the, my memory may be uh, jarbled, but I do remember the trial of Trayvon um, of Martin's killer, George Zimmerman, occurring in proximity to the time of maybe within a year and a year and a half. I'm sure I could Google it. I'm just going off my memory. But about a year and a year and a half in between that time where Michael Brown was killed and when those movements were created and the, and the entire nation began to see through social media what's happening to black people all the time. The politics of this country changed. All of a sudden, the right in this country, they had they had even more evidence to to push that Barack Obama was really this radical socialist Black Panther, uh, 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 you know, uh, Manchurian candidate of the nation of Islam. You know, because now the nation is talking about race. And so they had all the dem- all the all the evidence that they needed to demagogue over Barack Obama being racist. Likewise, similarly, the Democratic Party started to change. What was acceptable was no longer acceptable. And I think people have a problem with this. If you say something remotely positive in, in any category, you say one thing positive about the Democratic Party, then that means that you are a Democratic shield. Well, please reply to this, this, um, to this tweet that you saw this in. Reply in the comments section so that I can see that you are an intentionally obtuse individual and, and I can block you because you fall into that category of people who are not worth our time. Whereas there are millions of people out there that can be organized that are worth our time. But anyway, the Democratic Party fundamentally changed because they started listening to black women. And you may not like that sentence, but it's the it's the damn truth if I've ever heard it. Hillary Clinton clearly listened to black women in the 2016 election. You know how I know? Because she was delivering messages against racism and white supremacy 
in a manner that I had been telling y'all that Bernie Sanders needed to do. I literally have a tape back in the tape. God, I'm showing my age. I have a video, <clears throat> a YouTube video back in 2015 where I explained. I explained the reason why Bernie Sanders was going to lose. I explained the problem because the problem was if Bernie Sanders, Sanders could not communicate on race based on the way that, that this nation was going, then he was going to he was going to lose. And the reason he wasn't going to be able to effectively communicate on, on race was what I mistakenly called back in 2015, the Reddit crowd. Right. I just got, I didn't really have a name for it. I, you know, Reddit wasn't the most accurate way to describe it. But later on, it would be described as the Bernie bro crowd. Right. And of course, that was a pejorative as it was a tool. <laughs> it was literally a tool that, that that Hillary Clinton got from black women who gave her the language of intersectionality. So you could say whatever you want to say about Hillary. The one thing that she got right is like the one thing that people are saying we should not do, which was communicate effectively on race. That's that's like the only thing that she did right. That she she actually stood up against the white supremacy. There was a speech that she gave against the uh, when I think it was the same speech where she called out the deplorables. She called out white supremacy by name. And you know what? She was right. She was right about deplorables. She was wrong about so many other things, but she's right about the deplorables. We were never going to reach them. And if you're sitting back and saying, oh, well, that's why she lost. Then my question to you is, if that's why she lost, do you think that we should have a voter outreach to racists in order to win? To people who laugh at the rape charges against Kavanaugh. They gloat and they drink beers in celebration. The people, uh, the people who now are defending Saudi Arabia um, against their war crimes because uh, because Donald Trump told them to you, you uh, the, the Breitbart crowd. Do you really think that we should have a voter? If, if you think that we should reach out to them, then you need to read my friend's comment on Facebook where he said that those people who are upset with Stacey Abrams for burning the Confederate flag. We're never going to be in your coalition in the first place. And if you spend time catering and courting people who would who find it pleasurable, <laughs> who enjoy the bigotry and the white supremacy of Donald Trump, literally his polls have gone up. I saw, you know, his polls have gone up. Some some of it is in response to the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh. That you can either see that as a problem with how the Democrats fought against Brett Kavanaugh, or you could see that as the fact that those people are not redeemable. They are not worth our time. They are not worth our political investment, not when there are millions of other voters who can be reached, particularly with an economic populist message, and they can be reached without the baggage of being silent or complicit with white supremacy in this country. It is the same thing. What are you willing to pay to reach these voters? If they are racist, if they are sexist, if they are joyfully homophobic, if they are celebratingly Islamophobic, if they get their uh, shiggles, their shits and giggles off of hurting others, what the Atlantic uh, Atlantic's Adam Sewer called uh, deemed uh, or termed rather. Um, he termed as the, the brutality is the point, right? That's the thing. The racism is the thing. It is, their, it is the point. That's why they like Donald Trump. If you think our time is, is, is best suited by courting them at any cost, I, I, then I have to question whether or not you are actually a part of a coalition. I really have to question that. And whereas I have this ongoing disagreement with Joy, uh, with Bree and some other people on the from the left side of the spectrum, um, I we engage and we're going to disagree with the in the marketplace of ideas. And um, I don't think that her goal is to um, support racists. Right. To be sure, I don't think that that's her goal. I think that she's misguided in, in the cost associated with her goal. The natural cost associated with the goal of reaching out to racists or reaching out to people who are racially anxious or, or whatever, however you want to describe it, it's going to cost you 
your allies. It's going to it's going to require that you have a certain level of silence on the issues that are critical to your allies because the world has changed. We are no longer at the point where the Democratic Party can can be a party of of having sister soldier moments. It can't. It won't ever go back to that in 92. <clears throat> Hillary Clinton tried to tr- morph into something that she she couldn't. You know, I didn't even like the way she presented her 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 identity politics. It got video after video on it. It didn't seem genuine to me. But I knew, you know what I knew was that she was smart enough to hire black women to give her the messaging that was a, that was necessary for the, the, the political lay of the land in 2016. And she listened to them. While Bernie made misstep after misstep after misstep, some were forced errors, some were unforced errors, some were legitimate and some were not legitimate. Some were the weaponization of identity politics, which literally I'm trying to think who coined the phrase. It probably was me who coined that phrase back in 2015. Some of it was the weaponization of identity politics and some of it was actual mistakes that Bernie Sanders made on race. Which goes back to the wisdom of what I said back in 2014, 2015, was that Bernie, in order to win, he was going to have to master the conversation on race. He was going to have to understand the perspective of black people and be able to communicate it. And he won't be able to do that unless he unless he actually hires black consultants who can help him to understand that. And anyone around us that is saying that that shouldn't be the case, that shouldn't be what he has to do, then you are not prioritizing or rather you are deprioritizing our issues issues yes we have common issues in terms of economic populism of course but we do have issues that we have to address that any politician who wants the vote of the black community is going to have to be able to communicate based on so the bottom line is 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 simply this um there are people that we will never reach because they get joy in their bigotry or out of their bigotry. They've made that clear. And anybody who still thinks that we should utilize resources to reach out to them, that we should mince words with regard to white supremacy to reach out to them, anyone who thinks that, I don't really, I, I, I'm not really sure if you're even a part of our of of our ally of our coalition of a coalition that that understands a coalition that the democratic party is not even yet <laughs> i'm going to i'm going to say this again and i'm going to reiterate this because people are intentionally obtuse and they want to say that this entire my entire existence is is to um to work for the democratic party Um, But what these uh, brilliant people don't understand is that what we're calling for is not for anyone to get into the Democratic Party or to vote for Democrats based on who they are right now. We're saying to take it over, to take it over and demand at a minimum demand, whether you get involved or not, demand that this current party gets its stuff together, particularly on economic policy. But Damn it, if we're not going to say that we draw the line at your strategy, including working with racists, working with white supremacists, working with fascists for any agenda whatsoever, not only because it puts us at direct risk, it puts marginalized community at direct risk. It also is because it's it's imbecilic to think that they have any common goal with you, whether it be anti-war, whether it be anti-corporatism or whether it be anti uh, of climate denial pro uh, climate change whatever your goal is there is not a single person on the right who prides themselves in being conservative and rejecting identity politics and rejecting uh, uh, feminism and rejecting climate science none of those people all those people who support they support corporatism they support war They support everything that you are willing to sacrifice us for in order to be in league with them. It makes absolutely no sense. I've said this so many times and I'm tired of saying it. But that that tweet or that Facebook post from Marcus Perel actually makes the point. 
the people, the same type of people who look at Stacey Abrams burning the Confederate flag and have a problem with it are the same exact people who were never going to work with you in the first place. So why waste any sleep over them when there are millions of people who never voted that you can go and get? Many of which probably agree with you on race as well. Well, let me say this. Agree with me on race as well. Because the fact that some of you are willing to sacrifice us <laughs> in exchange for that uh, lets me know that we clearly don't see eye to eye on race. Um, but anyway, I'll get that video out. I'm going to probably re- re-record the video at least another time. This will be my third time because I think it's very important for us to c- continue to have that conversation of how religion is affecting politics and how um, the black uh, liberation theology is the antidote to evangelical Christianity. You're not going to get away. I mean, you can you can feel free to comment in the comment section. Oh, just just leave religion. Well, OK, that's not going to happen for millions of people. Right. So the real question is, how do we mitigate? How do we um, mitigate the, the, the effects of evangelical Christianity? And the real way to do it is black liberation theology, because that's how we got the progress of the civil rights movement in the first place. So the video is important. The conversation is important. I'm, I'm going to go back to the drawing board and start the video again. Um, but until then, uh, I wanted to get this out. Um, thank a patron because I got this out to make sure that I take care of them. And in taking care of them, I did a whole 30 minutes and 55 seconds, 58, 59. See you next time, people. Take care. The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.thebenjamindixonshow.com to register for our blog and join the Progressive Army. 